Greetings and welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for May 9th, 2021. I am Reverend Mary Tillman and I will be your presenter for today. We continue in Unit 3, Courageous Prophets of Change. Today we're in lesson number 10. The lesson title in the Adult Quarterly is Offering Hope for the Future. The lesson title in Faith Pathway Bible Studies for Adults, Empty Rituals Are Useless. Our devotional reading, Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14. The background scripture is the 29th chapter of Isaiah. Our print passage, Isaiah 29, verses 13 through 24. Our key verse, the 24th verse of the 29th chapter of Isaiah from the NIV Bible reads, Those who are wayward in spirit will gain understanding. Those who complain will accept instruction. And I'd like to read that same verse from the New Living Translation Bible. That is the 24th verse of the 29th chapter of Isaiah from the New Living Translation Bible. It reads thusly, Those in error will then believe the truth, and those who constantly complain will accept instruction. From our lesson background and introduction, we note that several authors have written thought-provoking commentaries about worship and the conflicts that have arisen in congregations over preferred worship styles and music genres. We know there is a generational gap in our church song service selections. Some prefer the traditional back down home style of devotion where the deacons open up with the Dr. Watt call and response songs, while others prefer the contemporary style of devotion with a praise team singing more inspirational rather than spiritual songs and hymns. Instead of the congregation being divided on which is preferred, the combination of each is a blessing to the body of Christ. After all, it is not the how of worship, but it is the who of our worship. Let me say that again. It's not about the how of worship, but it is the who of our worship. True worship focuses only on God as an audience of one. When all is said and done, we all should be participating in the worship experience. The only non-participant is the one to whom we offer true praise, and that is the Lord our God. He made us to worship him, and he alone should be the total audience to whom we lift our voices in adoration and in praise, whether we're doing it in speech, in song, or in deed. John 4 and 23 says, God is spirit, and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. We must worship God in the beauty of holiness. This matter of real worship as opposed to ritualistic worship is not new. God's chosen people, the children of Israel, allowed their worship to become nothing more than meaningless rituals and festival events. They were just going through the motions following a printed program, if you will, with no thought or reverence to God. The prophet Isaiah was used to show them the uselessness of approaching God with insincerity while expecting to receive his continued blessings. I mean, they were doing this without any thought to God, but they expected him to continue to bless them. How ridiculous could that be? Well, there are three questions that I want you to consider. Number one, why did Isaiah condemn Judah's worship? Number two, what happens when true worship occurs? And question number three, what does Isaiah say about the promise of a future transformation that will be vastly different? Before we get into the context and the study of the lesson, let us pray. Our Father and our God, we so thank you for this opportunity 
to share your word and the lesson. Open up our understanding that we may be able to apply these lessons that we learn. And help us, God, not to give you just lip service, but to worship with you, worship you with our whole heart in spirit and in truth. Amen. Let's look at the lesson context. The book of Isaiah is named for its author, the prophet Isaiah. He ministered to Judah during the reigns of kings Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. The focus of his prophetic ministry was to condemn the empty ritualism and idolatry that was evidence of the nation's spiritual decline. Many of the prophecies of Isaiah pertain predictions that foretell a soon-to-occur event and a distant future event at the same time. Isaiah is the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. Isaiah was a strong and courageous man of God who fiercely proclaimed the word of God, a true prophet of change. He soon became unpopular because his messages were so difficult to hear. Isaiah called upon Judah, Israel, and the surrounding nations to repent of their sins. He warned them of God's judgment and punishment. Chapters 28 through 31 make up a series of prophetic oracles. An oracle typically consisted of songs of blessings for obedience and warnings for disobedience that began with the interjection, Woe! Chapter 29 contains a specific woe oracle against Jerusalem. In fact, chapters 28 through 33 contain five Woe sermons preached by the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 29, verses 1 through 12, Isaiah describes the coming judgment on the city. The folly of empty worship is explained in verses 13 through 21, and the promise of future restoration in verses 22 through 24. When we choose to ignore the word of God, disregard his commandments, and lean to our own understanding, we set ourselves up for disappointment, failure, and punishment. However, in this lesson, Isaiah also prophesies that after the punishment, there is deliverance. This week's lesson's aims are... As a result of experiencing this lesson, you should be able to do these things. Aim number one. Consider how God's promise of mercy will triumph over God's judgment. Number two. Believe that the essential nature of God is forgiveness, not punishment. And number three. Rejoice in the manifestation of God's love in your own life. There are two lesson outlines in the Adult Pathway Sunday School book. I will share two key points from each of these outlines and expound some on each one. Outline number one. Perfunctory worship exposed. Isaiah 29 Verses 13 through 16. Verses 13 through 16 from the NIV Bible reads, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. Therefore, Once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish. The intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord, who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us, who will know. You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. 
Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? Key point number one. God wants our real and true worship. Isaiah was aware that many Israelites were only going through the motions of the ritualistic ceremonial aspects of worship, as if God was not aware of their actions and insincerity. We see that in verse 13. They were more committed to the formality of worship than the true spiritual nature of the worship experience. You know, a real true worship experience is something that you truly enjoy being a part of and you are wholly and totally absorbed up in the experience itself of devoting and focusing on God himself. But these people had no intention in pleasing God, yet they considered themselves to be righteous because of going through the motions of worship and participation in the feast days and rituals. They had no genuine relationship with God. The people could quote the scriptures and knew the right words to say, but their hearts had no true devotion to God. Their worship came from a sense of habit and tradition. Real worship is entering into God's presence and expressing heartfelt love and genuine adoration. We should enter his courts with thanksgiving and enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Worship is reverence for God's holiness and authority. Our worship must be honest and sincere. Israel's worship did not touch the heart of God. It was nothing more than lip service and an empty ritualistic worship to God. Mm. Key point number two. God is ever-present and all-knowing. Nothing can ever be hidden from him, not our deeds, our thoughts, or the intentions of our hearts. God knows everything, our personal plans, our thoughts, and our secrets, too. He knows our name and everything about us, the very intent of our hearts. God knew the intent of their hearts, and would judge them accordingly. And we see that in verse 14. When we look at verse 15, it begins with the word woe. God was also aware of their secret plans to form an alliance with Egypt against Assyria, although they tried to hide it from him. True worship honors God by being God-centered rather than self-centered. Self-centered worship treats God as the created and not the creator. We see that in verse 16. When I just read that where it says, you turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? How can the created not recognize the creator is superior? God uses the analogy of the potter and the clay to point out that Israel treated God as if he were mere clay that could be manipulated by their rituals and ceremonies. God would never receive or acknowledge such forms of empty worship from any of his creations, not even us today. We must be true in our worship and in our praise. It has to be true praise for God to get the glory. Outline number two, transformation promised. Key point number one. Our transformation promised is found in Isaiah 29, verses 17 through 24. Let's look at key point number one. Isaiah predicts a future transformation. Isaiah's message shifted from announcing God's condemnation of ritualistic worship to the promise of a future transformation. God declared it would be different for his people. 
Isaiah figuratively described it as the forest of Lebanon becoming a field and a fertile field becoming a forest. This illustration of a massive contrast or upheaval shows the drastic transformation that was coming to Israel as God renewed them. They would undergo things they never expected. What a revival, what a renewal, what a restoration. Key point number two, Isaiah predicts blessings and transformative changes in the lives of the children of Israel. Isaiah predicted five future blessings and transformations, and they are, number one, the spiritually impaired would no longer exist in Israel, and all the people would be receptive to God's word. Number two, the afflicted and needy would experience spiritual refreshing. Number three, their oppressors would be cut off. Number four, God's family would expand to include Gentiles. That's us. Anyone not of Jewish descent is a Gentile. Their iniquities would no longer be a source of shame to their forefathers. And number five, those who rebelled against God would be receptive to instruction and come to know the truth. And we see that in verse 24, which was is our key verse to this lesson that we read in the beginning of the lesson. So my brothers and sisters, in, in summary, the purpose of God's discipline is restoration rather than condemnation. The scripture says, God chastens those he loves. You can find that in Hebrews 12, verses 3 through 11. God disciplines his children to bring about spiritual transformation in their lives in preparation for promised blessings. The peaceable fruit of righteousness suggests that the result of God's chastening is peace and righteousness. When our worship is genuine, True believers can trust God to forgive and restore in spite of great personal failure. Worship that is sincere and God-focused transforms the worshiper in the presence of God. Worship focused on personal gratification rather than giving God the glory and honor he deserves is simply a meaningless ritual with no possibility of spiritual transformation. Oh my goodness. God is not moved by empty religious rituals that have no regard for his presence and failure to glorify him for who he is. We must recognize the ever-powerful almighty God and glorify him because he is God. Judah's spiritual condition deteriorated to the point that their worship was nothing more than lip service. They elevated themselves above God and depended on their own intellect for deliverance instead of trusting in God. Distracted, superficial worship that is merely a matter of habit and obligation means nothing to God. It is just like distracted driving. It leads to self-destruction. We must never get to the point of thinking that God isn't aware of what we're thinking or what we're planning. He already knows. That's why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, my favorite scripture, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Also, in the book of Psalms, Psalms 119 and 105 to be exact, the scripture reads, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Bishop Larry Trotter and the Sweet Holy Spirit Choir 
sang and recorded this song, and I want to share it with you because it talks about my worship. It's personal. The name of the song is My Worship is for Real. And if you get a chance, go out on YouTube and listen to this song, Bishop Larry Trotter and Sweet Holy Spirit. It goes like this. You don't know my story, all the things that I've been through. You can't feel my pain, what I had to go through to get here. You'll never understand my praise. Don't try to figure it out because my worship, my worship is for real. And it goes on to say, I've been through too much not to worship him. You see, my worship, my worship is for real. So I say, hallelujah, hallelujah. My worship is for real. You're so worthy. You're so worthy. My worship is for real. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My worship is for real. My brothers and sisters, be sure your worship is for real. And at your leisure, please read Psalm 95. It is a call to worship and obedience. And it places particular emphasis on the worship of God, making it a worship psalm. It is great reading and it should inspire us to be more sincere in our worship experience. True, genuine worship is a personal matter. There has to be an intimate relationship between the Lord and me, between the Lord and you. So I leave you with this question. Is your worship for real or is it just lip service? Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this lesson. We are ever capable of straying away from you. Please forgive us when we have been guilty of coming into your presence with distracted minds and empty words. Draw us closer that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. May our worship and service to you never find us lacking in devotion. Renew our hearts today so that the unbelieving world can see Christ in us. This is our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, God bless you. I hope you got a thought from today's lesson. And remember this, your worship and my worship has to be real. My worship is for real. God bless you, enjoy your day.